And now it's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for this morning, uh, Dr. Anne O'Neill, who is chairperson, founder, patron, and clinical supervisor of Angel Hands, Inc. Dr. Anne O'Neill is an award-winning humanitarian, victimologist, educator, activist, volunteer, and researcher. Her interests lie in social justice and victims of serious interpersonal crimes such as homicide and family and domestic violence. She has a unique and innovative approach to motivating, educating, and assisting government departments, organizations, and people to deal with trauma, stress, and changing their lives and their workplaces. Her pursuits are recognized internationally, and she has presented in England, Croatia, and the United States, and founded and directed Angel Hands, Inc. for more than a decade, inspiring people in all areas of life to follow their dreams. And this morning's uh, presentation by Anne is entitled, What Do Victims, Survivors Tell Us They Need to Help Them Heal? Can we please welcome Anne to the podium? Thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to speak to such a wonderful and sizable audience this morning, uh, being this time of the program. Many of you will be tired and in research terms reaching saturation point. So I thank you for coming out on this morning. Uh, I'd like to thank and acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands that we meet upon today and their elders past and present. I'd also just like to make a note, um, those of you old enough to remember going to the DVD stores or video stores, you know, you could see, you know, a label that, you know, warning, coarse language, violence, sex scenes, those sorts of things. I come with those labels and, uh, and I urge you to seek appropriate care because I won't assume that people in the audience are not affected by any of the issues that I speak of today. So don't, and I'm, I'm sure around the world that the counsel that many of us seek from Johnny Walker, Jimmy Beam, you know, and Jack Daniels is a universal language. So I ask you to make sure you seek appropriate counsel if you need it and support afterwards. Uh, I also need to set the frame a little bit and, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit at the beginning of my presentation about some of the conceptual matters and what I share here today is around constructive learning, not criticism of anyone or any agencies. I really struggled, um, the title that I think you can see, yes, behind me, is just slightly different from that in your handout because I really struggled with the term victim and survivor and I struggled with it since my undergrad degree and I think we all do. And I replaced it with people. And I did that because I think as people it recognises that we can all be vulnerable. I think it recognises that we can all be strong and survivors and we can all be victimised. And I, I know from my own experiences and walking beside people, if we put people in a victim terminology, that works in a criminal justice setting. But if we put them in the term survivor, in a therapeutic setting, that's appropriate. But I also know that if we see them only as survivors, then where is the space for their vulnerability to be recognised and responded to? So I urge you to think about how we even refer to people who are traumatised through violent experiences. Uh, I think I don't have too many acronyms within this, and I think most of you will know all of them. VOC, Victim of Crime. Um, I also, for the international people in the audience, want to acknowledge that in Australia there is no consistent um, federal jurisdiction covering the needs or responses to victims of crime. The states have their own acts, their own criminal codes, and we work very well together in the most part. However, the, the federal act only covers federal crimes. So there, you can't be guaranteed if a crime happens in a different state that the, you know, there's going to be the same responses that in your own state. I also want to say I've assumed a level of knowledge in the room around trauma and its construction and how we understand it to be therapeutically and of the criminal justice system. I also just want to remind us all of the achievements 
of how far in the last sort of 30 years victimology has come. If we think of sort of the way, the second wave of feminist movement and the, the start of refuges, the start of responding to domestic violence, the start of responding to children who are sexually abused, women who are sexually abused, we're now seeing that grow and evolve. So I think that as a, as a actual, um, Discipline, we need to remind ourselves that this is a heuristic process. This is something that we will continually be refining. You know, will we ever get it right? I'm, I'm not sure that we'll ever get it 100% perfect, but we'll always be doing the best we can. And so today, with a focus on people, and I don't know how many of you have looked at, at the cartoon on my front slide, but I really would like to draw your attention to it because sometimes people can think that they're not going to hurt us. They're just going to give us a 12-step program, is what the caption says. And I think often that is what it feels like for people. You know, where am I going? I'm walking down this gangway and I have no idea of what is about to happen to me. So um, I'm going to see if I can operate this technology. It's not always my forte. Um, people need you to understand social support after extreme trauma. What is, who provides it, what makes it helpful, and how to deliver it. That's what I'm hoping to, to give you an overview of in our very short time together. In order to contextualise what I tell you, I'm faced with the dilemma as a victimologist, as someone who researches and studies this academically, who thinks about it objectively as one might, do I actually disclose my own journey to this I am a forced expert in this area. I never wanted to be a victimologist. I left school at the end of year 10. I always knew I'd go back and study social justice, but victimology, not in your life. Didn't know what it was, didn't want to know. Um, but I had experiences in my life that forced me to understand what family and domestic violence was, what homicide meant, and what happens to people after your family has been killed in front of you, when services in the health profession don't know what to do with you, when support services were just emerging in the, the mid-90s. I was faced with this situation of absolute bleakness, and I liken it to having been in a book full of characters and life and, and excitement and activity to suddenly being on a blank page. And I had to start writing the story of my life again. No longer was I a mother. Suddenly I was a disabled woman. Suddenly I was a widow and I was, you know, I'd been married to a man who committed multiple murder. How did I begin to make sense of this world that I never, ever, ever wanted to be part of? So I went to the library and I found glossy biographies and autobiographies and, and no disrespect, but predominantly from North America, of people who, you know, had fantastically sensationalist stories. And I couldn't really relate to much of it. It didn't make a lot of sense to me. It didn't tell me how to get through the day. It didn't tell me the basic things of how to understand the superannuation law or the fact that the coroner still hadn't decided if there was gonna be an inquest two years later. It didn't help me with the nitty gritty. So during my recovery, I had the, I'm not sure if it was the fortune or misfortune to be asked to speak at the National Domestic Violence Conference, but they didn't tell me that. And I got up to give my little um, reflection on my experience to a small group that turned out to be 600 people. And in my usual sense of humour, I looked at the audience and thought, okay, I'd done some, some introduction to counselling and they said the top 10 stresses, you know, number one's death, about number three's public speaking. Well, I've conquered number one. <laughs> so I can get through number three, and I, I started realising I had this voice. And then I was asked to study social work. Hated social workers as a child. I'd had awful experiences of them, um, but I was convinced that there were good social workers and that the curriculum would teach me what I needed to know. And pray I've, I've met many fantastic social workers, and in fact, I'm very proud to call myself one. 
During this time, I was asked to be the inaugural chair of the Homicide Victim Support Group here in Western Australia. The only people who would give me a job was the, one of our local refuges because I was disabled and fairly unskilled, uh, which I have to say was terrifying, but I needed the money and, uh, and I did it. I then graduated, worked with kids who lit fires, started Angel Hands, did my first piece of research into the experiences of secondary victims of homicide. And I did a narrative study of what it was that they experienced, how they framed it, and what they wanted to tell other people about the experience to get them through. And that is also useful for practitioners to have some insight into what it's like. It's not glossy, it's not glamorous, there was no funding, so there is no glossy cover either. However, um, I now work at the health department and have since done my PhD in international health. And my PhD topic is primarily what will inform what I talk about, but I come with all of these other wisdoms and all of these experiences. I've worked with family and domestic violence victims, assault victims, you know, institutional abuse. So I bring in a, a number of examples. So my presentation isn't pure in lots of ways, um, but I think it's, it's purely about people if I have to position it. And uh, I'm not sure, but... The quote that I think I'd really like you to take away, if nothing else, is that when this happened to me, I thought someone should do something. Then I realised I was someone, in the words of JFK. And I would like to remind you, you are all someone, and in your roles you are making a difference, but I'd like you to continue to make that difference, and I thank you for that. Um, I also want to remind you that at any moment, as my story tells you, we could experience sexual assault, family and domestic violence, a homicide, an armed robbery, be the victim of a one-punch assault. We could be victim of what's called a common assault. I'm not sure what a common assault really is if you think of the lived experience of it, but we know what it is legally. We could be kidnapped. We, um, unfortunately, many of the children in our community can be incest victims, bag snatching, carjacking, workplace assaults, elder abuse, hate crimes. You know, they are all violations against the person and we are all susceptible to, susceptible to that. Now, did I mention this might be interactive? No? I oh, know. Don't run. Keep the doors locked at the back, please. It's a very small and simple activity, but somebody once did this with me, and I'd like you all to fold your arms for me, please. If you can fold your arms and then unfold them, shake them about and fold them the other way. Weird? Hard? Who had to look? Quite a few people. Who had to really think? How was it before? Yep. So if a very small change, like folding our arms, it, you know, takes conscious thought, our muscles want to go back, who just wants to put them back how they were? Yep. That's what it is. That's a very small insight into when your world changes because of a violent act. If it's so hard to fold our arms a different way, how is it to learn how to live a different way? I once was asked to speak to Supreme Court judges and I was going through all these definitions of law, I was anxious and didn't know what to do and I, I went through all these definitions and none of them made sense to me from my perspective. So I came up with law is learning another way and it's a bit like the arm folding, you have to learn another way. You have to learn that in the presence of all of these elements of PTSD. And we know that regardless from the research, whether you are a victim of a property crime or a violent crime, you will experience acute post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms. You know, they're acute, they happen and they come down for people with property crime. About 80% of severe personal violence actually involves chronic PTSD symptoms in they last for more than six months and often for many years. So as I evolved and grew and learnt and talked to more and more people, I had this burning question because everybody said, oh, family, friends and community are the biggest sources of support. All the research refers to it, all the evaluations refer to it, but who 
are these family, friends and community? What do they do? And is it actually helpful? And are we burdening a group of people who really shouldn't be burdened with this? These were the questions I had as a researcher. So I took these questions and I asked myself, what is social support? And, you know, we keep talking about it, but what is it? So in its simplest form, it's the aid and assistance supplied, again, by family members, friends, neighbours and others. In its more complex and a little more academic definition, then it may be understood as this meta-construct with three aspects being support network resources, supportive behaviours and the individual's subjective appraisal of that support. So taking this little bit more of a, you know, uh, academic approach to it, I set out on a PhD, which in my jest I often called piled higher and deeper. However, I think having now completed it, it is the most difficult journey one can ever undertake in discipline, in rigour, and the life skills it has taught me are invaluable. I interviewed 28 people across England and Australia, 14 from each country. Between them, they had 26 primary victims of homicide and 32 offenders were responsible for the crimes they had experienced. On average, the interviews went for two and a half hours. I did a content analysis in which I asked five questions of the data, and I won't bore you with too much of that, but I will answer and, and tell you what those questions were as we go along. But when I looked and read and reread and reread these interviews, what I was looking for was how many times were different support sources discussed? Were those discussions of helpful or unhelpful support or support that was okay at the beginning and got worse or then, you know, was not good at the beginning but then it got better and in that frame I called it ambiguous. And then I went back and I looked at the, those discussions and I said, what was it that made, you know, within that conversation, if I have to really, really, you know, uh, condense what they're telling me into what made this support helpful, how would I describe it? So I came up with a very convoluted diagram that I'm not going to put up because it's far too early to make you all squint. But it, it is a framework for understanding the dimensions of social support and it's based on the work of Vaux, Riddle and Stewart and, and also added on some of, and I'm not good at pronunciation, Helgensen's work as well. And I've adapted it and sort of pulled these things together in a model. So what I found in talking to people was really beginning to understand and know the buffering effects of social support. What is it that protects them or actually promotes further harm within their own context, within them? And I'll, I'll talk about the situation, interpersonal and intrapersonal variables in a second. Then the main thing that was unique about my study was really drilling into this second part of what support is available. And then the third part, I wish I could say it was all stuff I'd discovered, but I just pulled together the summary of what people said was made support helpful or unhelpful, and I break that down a little bit. So within situational variables, we're looking at the socio-legal characteristics of the experience. We're looking at the phases of the stressful experience. We're looking at the severity of the stressor and what roles and things change, things like that. That's by no means exhausting, but it gives you an idea. If we look at the intrapersonal variables, what is the person's resilience? What other stresses are in their life? And how do they appraise support? Are they a person who, whose cup is half empty, whose cup is half full, or has it by gosh been stolen? You know, where are they in that? And interestingly, what the literature tells us is cynical people are more satisfied with support because they've actually got lower expectations, which you know, makes some sense when you think about it. 
um, what is their level of psychological well-being and their social skills to start with? What are their own personality characteristics? Are they shy? Are they introverted? You know, are they out there? You know, and what's their demographic profile? Are they at the early stage of their life where they may not have the confidence to ask questions? Are they old and isolated? Are they, you know, got a young family and stuck at home? Those sorts of things help us to understand their experience. And then the intrapersonal variables. What's their historical experiences? Where, you know, what have they experienced in life before? What is the origin of their supportive relationships? What's the duration of the relationships they're experience, and what's the nature of their interactions? Are they formal, informal, friendly, you know, unfriendly? So if we take that first lot and look at it in relation to who's in their support network, and, and this is the slide that I think is, is perhaps, you know, the, the most newest part of our evidence around who is community, family and friends, who makes it up. The uh, 714 discussions people had about social support identified 174 discrete relationships. So obviously I couldn't fit 174 different relationships on a diagram, so I condensed father, mother, stepfather, stepfather into parents and I consolidated all the data until I ended up with nine support systems which you'll see in blue with a total of 35 support sources which you'll see in the sort of orangey brown colour. I then sort of arranged them on the basis of whether or not this was a support source or system that they had come into contact with naturally you know, because it was part of their community, which is the social network, or were they support sources that they only came into contact because of their experience of violence? I don't have a lot of time to go through all of that, but what is fascinating is as we unpack it, what, what do those people provide and how is it helpful? The one thing I will mention at this um, point is the fact that offenders, everybody expected something from the offender or the people that represented them. And because the offender may or may not be known to the family prior to the offence, they sit in both of the systems, both the, or the, both of the networks, I should say. Um, they fit in the formal network and the, the social network. I hope I'm not losing anyone with that diagram. But you will see on this slide the percentage of conversations about each of those support systems and the number of support sources contained within each. Again, I won't drill down into that data too much, but I'll say that just um, short of 50% of support actually did come from friends, family and community. So we know that yes, they are involved and they certainly from, feature prominently in people's discussions. What is it when we look at another level, and this one will really make you feel a bit nauseous, um, if we look at them by source, who is the most helpful and who isn't? Now. By no surprise, new friends were 100% helpful. Well, of course, you're not gonna keep a new friend if they're not helpful so they don't become a new friend. Um, support groups, the data showed specialised um, homicide support groups were by far you know, overwhelmingly supportive. However, I must warn you there's some bias in that because I recruited through self-help support groups you know, to access the population. So I didn't access those people who they weren't supportive for. So that, that's a skewed finding in its, in its totality. I won't go through every one of those things independently, but I think what is interesting here is when you start to see, when we get down to less than 50, uh, less than 70% supportive, you know, we're starting to get into you know, GPs, you know, spiritual providers, funeral related providers, emergency services, media, community officials, generic therapeutic support. So we can see as we go more and more into the actual specialised, you know, sort of 
professionalised services, we start seeing less of um, discussions of helpful support. When we look at them as systems, it sort of fits as well. That's much less busy for you. So what is it that people told us, told me or, or within their discussions indicated that that support was helpful or unhelpful? It's not rocket science. As I said, I don't think I have found anything new here in that the characteristics of helpful support are that it's restoring as opposed to re-victimising. It's benevolent instead of malevolent. It's harmless instead of harmful. Now they sound like pretty basic things. Somebody asked me what malevolent meant. How can they be malevolent? We all think that after the unthinkable has happened, the society will be kind, compassionate and caring, but not always so. For example, superannuation and life insurance companies may not pay out on life insurance policies until there's a final death certificate. Banks may not allow redraw until there's a final death certificate. Things that we put into place to help people in their time of need are often inaccessible during you know, the, the aftermath of a crime such as homicide. So it, that, that's what I mean by malevolent. They actually don't put the interests of people first. The elements of support, again, not rocket science. They're private and confidential. It's timely interventions. It's informative, but it's accurate information. It's not having to go, you know, to 15 different places. It's support that's proactively offered. You know, you're told in advance of who to see. You're given warm referrals as opposed to cold referrals. You know, here's a number, go and ring. They should be able to help you versus like, let's sit here, let's ring, let's make sure, okay, now I'm going to put you on the phone to Mary who's going to help you. That's what I mean by the difference between cold and warm referrals. Um, it's non-judgmental and non-discriminatory. Again, not rocket science, but the most common question I got asked was, what did you do to make him do that? And unfortunately, I wish that I could say that people in my study had different questions but they also were asked a lot about what the victim did, what they did to make this happen. There is a sense of victim blaming that is very alive and well. It's appropriate to culture, age and ability. And by ability, I don't just mean our, our physiological, intellectual ability, it's also our ability in the face of extreme trauma. You know, who here has had a car accident? Who remembered to get all the details you needed to get and, you know, get everything right? Did anybody manage to get it all right? No? So when we're traumatised, when we're in shock, retaining information, knowing what to do, re remembering, you know, all those fine details are very, very difficult things to do. I myself recently had a car run up my behind as I was driving to, to, to work and I took a photo of the car so I had his number plate and all of that but stupidly the front of the car was all smashed in. I couldn't read his number plate. <laughs> you know, just a classic example of how we're functioning at a particular time. Uh, it needs to be holistic. We can't just see the person in isolation accessible. And, and one of the really interesting things, and I'll, I'll tell you what um, people in my study actually wanted support to look like, but a lot of the services that are actually there to help people are often inaccessible. Even things like driving to the morgue to identify their loved ones. How do people get there? You know, the amount of people who said, you know, I don't even know how I drove there. I got the phone call and I went and to meet the place, but I've got no idea. So practical, accessible, you know, yes, there were nice people there to help you, but what about actually getting you there safely in the midst of all of this? Uh, reliable and consistent, and that's from the person at the front desk 
right through to the professionals delivering the service. It is absolutely no good, and I say this to Angel Hands people all the time, do not say somebody is here on the phone because somebody whose trust has been shattered, if you go looking for somebody and they're suddenly not available, the, they will believe that the secretary or the you know, receptionist is lying, that that person actually doesn't want to talk to them. So you have to make sure that your front end staff are trained just as much as your professional staff around how to be reliable and consistent in your response to people who are traumatised. They need to be victimologically aware, and I'll explain that a little bit more later, um, but whatever you do needs to be based on empowerment. And uh, I did have a lovely little slide for you, but I, I decided not to put it, and there's a guy in, in jail, and he says, I want to be part of your research project. I just want to make sure I get the placebo. <laughs> so it, it's a great example of what is empowerment. Um, so the thematic findings of my study, if we just boil it all down, um, is that we, we've... Supporters need to be aware of the dynamic, complex and elongated nature of, of a violent experience, particularly a homicide experience. These, these are lifelong journeys. They're not going to get better. It can't be fixed. And the criminal justice system, parole system and often appeal systems take a long, long time, years to actually get through. Supportive behaviours that go beyond what people expect, you know, that make people human. Everybody I talked to, I thought we would start with this sucked, that sucked, the other sucked, this person was horrible. It actually took the first hour to get past people saying everybody did the best they could, everybody was lovely. You know, they, they tried to be as grateful as they could for every morsel of support that they got. But there was always a human story. There was the court officer who showed us to a private space, who brought them tissues, you know. There was the lady at the lawyer's office who made them a cup of tea. There was the counsellor who came around to the house instead of making them go to the office. There was, you know, somebody who talked to them while they bathed the kids at night. You know, it was that going a little bit above the expected that helped people to heal. And if you think about it in reality, trauma shatters people's faith in the goodness of the world, the predictability of the world, the kindness of people in it, you know, and the predictability of it. So when people do things that are over and above, that make human beings seem real and human again, then that's healing. And, and somebody once said to me, you know, we're all human beings struggling to grow, and we live in a society that's very ready to come along and give you a teaspoon of weed killer. However, how many people come and give us a teaspoon of fertiliser? So these little actions that go above and beyond are like a teaspoon of really strong fertiliser that help people in their trauma recovery journey. And family and friends are extremely important sources, no surprise, but they're not prepared for it. People found their support helpful because they made allowances that they don't understand trauma, they don't understand grief, and they don't know what to do, but they did the best they could. So we really need to be educating communities on trauma, on trauma responses. We need family intervention programs after extreme trauma. At Angel Hands, we often work with friends and family of the primary victim of a, of a violent offence, as opposed to ever talking to the primary victim themselves, because we educate them about what they can do and how to respond and what's a normal, you know, traumatic sort of process. So they can do that without introducing another professional, another stranger into that person's life. And, uh, and people were exceptionally understanding of the tension between meeting their own needs and having you know, the needs of their family members met as well. And I guess that brings us to that last sort of thematic finding of the importance of not compartmentalising the types of support. You know, there's no good going in. And, and I remember being in hospital, having psychologists and psychiatrists thrown at me left, right and centre. Um, I don't know if I mentioned I lost my right leg. Don't you love that euphemism? If anybody finds it, please let me know. You know, I have no idea. Apparently it became the property of the coroner. I really even don't know what happened to it. 
to this day. However, if I find it, I'll give it a footnote. <laughs> I know, I've got a really dark sense of humour, sorry. Um, now I've lost my thinking. Uh, so, so yes, they were telling me all these things that I would feel and how I would mourn my leg and I would do this and I would do that and I would do the other. And to me, it's always only ever been five toes and an ankle because I lost two children, you know? That was, they were the real victims of this crime. And I needed support that was practical. I was stuck in hospital. I had, I became homeless effectively because the home I was renting, I couldn't go back to, I was in hospital for two and a half months. You know, I needed really practical support. I needed people to help with the bills, with the funerals, with, you know, life insurance, with the in-law relationships, you know, with all these different dynamics. It was not, how do you feel, let's sit and, you know, sort through this. But in doing the practical, the other stuff came out. I also needed information about what was going to happen. You know, he was dead. He killed himself. So, you know, was there going to be a trial? You know, I didn't understand law. I didn't know any of that stuff at this time. You know, why weren't the police interested in what, what had happened beforehand? Why was it such an open and closed case where, you know, they really weren't trying to find out if there was anyone else who helped him and, and da da da? So I needed, you know, real guidance on the procedural aspects of what was going to happen as well. And that was reiterated time and time again. And just after I came out of hospital and was involved in the Homicide Victim Support Group, a police officer and I came up with this diagram. And we tried to help people to understand how much is going on when the unthinkable happens. Now, I think this is a laser light. So if we look up here, it's unthought of. Who here's, we know we've had car accidents, but who here has health insurance? Yep, who has car insurance? who has household contents insurance. Do any of you actually expect to have an accident? To get robbed? To end up in hospital? No. So as much as we're prepared for these things, when something we can't even get insurance for, we don't even think about crime happening to us. When it happens, you know, it, it's un, unbelievably out of your paradigm. The lady up here mentioned a paradigm shift. It is the biggest paradigm shift you're ever going to be. And the, the, such a, a trauma marker is your life then and your life now and the difference between them. And if any of you in my first piece of research, I talk about sitting there with a plastic, you know those plastic wind barriers? And you can sort of see your life before, but it's dimpled and rippled and not quite right. It, you, you can't reach it. You can't get back to it. It's different from this side. And that's what it feels like for people. But what happens? What would happen if, if you suddenly couldn't go back into your home right now? What are the sorts of things that you would need to... What, what would you be thinking? God, you know, I mean, the media wrote, I kept a nice, clean cottage. Isn't that nice? But what would you have to do? And I mentioned I came with a sex warning. You know, one of the most common things that particularly couples talked about was, you know, their toys. They wanted their toys put away before the police went in and ripped the place apart. You know, we all have private things. We don't want other people to see. Not implying I know anything about any of you, but it's it's that sort of invasion. Somebody I worked closely with once likened it to have, and, and they were a suspect in the investigation to start with, um, in the murder of their wife. And they said it was like having their guts ripped open and put on the table and somebody going through it, you know, as in a medical sort of examination, and then stuffing it back in and saying, OK, well, you didn't do it, radio, off you go. And that's what it sort of feels like. But if we look at the support offered by all of these, thank goodness the majority of support is helpful. However, what I also found in my research was the, the construct that people who are traumatised are very similar. And, and I framed my whole dissertation in health because the criminal justice system only lasts so long. The health consequences, the ongoing impact of this on people's health, on their employment, on their social relationships is a lifetime. 
So I framed this in, in health in that this is about well-being. This is an issue that we should all be thinking of as a lifelong well-being issue. And um, with that in mind, we realise people offer helpful support, but there is their immunity to further victimisation and further trauma is lowered. So if you use that HIV analogy, that somebody with a HIV virus has a very low immune system, a common cold has the capacity to really threaten their life, their well-being, you know, their, their in its entirety. So if somebody has experienced extreme trauma, their resistance, their immunity to subsequent re-victimisations is exceptionally low. You know, how many more, you know, the straw that broke the camel's back, how many times can a little thing, you know, be done to somebody before they actually break? And unfortunately, we don't collect suicide statistics after homicides, we don't match them up and to who suicided after there's been a homicide in their family, but I know from my practice there is a correlation in many, many cases. Um, examples of things that people experience that, that threaten their well-being after extreme trauma is are things like um, taking the evidence from the home, not having your answering machine to screen the calls. You know, now, thank goodness, we've got Message Bank 101, but you know, what do you do, you know, if, if you haven't got an answering machine? What do you do if you haven't got a bed because there's been a sexual assault? Who buys a new one and puts it in there for you? What do you do if you can't go home? One couple that I worked closely with, the police, you know, had put them into a, a family friend's home. And that was great during the week while the kids were at school. But on the weekend when the kids were at home, their daughter, who was their friend, had just been murdered. So they drove around in their car for hours feeling that they had nowhere to go. Now, it saved the state a cost of putting them in a hotel, but for that couple, they were in exile. They didn't belong anywhere for a whole weekend, you know, because their, their trauma was being, ex, you know, exaggerated by being exposed to their, their friend of their daughters. Um, in saying that, when police think of these things, when they're kind, compassionate, take them to private spaces, give them coffee, give them tea, they, they're not big things, but they're things that, that actually rebuild their faith in human beings. The media not being blamed, the victim not being, you know, a sex worker, you know, a prostitute, a drug dealer, you know, what, what does that feel like when your loved one is, is deemed to be less than, than worthy of public support? Um, what does it do, like, we all talk about the media of that, invasion, but what happens if it doesn't even make the papers because you're Aboriginal, because you're from a remote community, because, you know, nobody even cares that your loved one dies? What does that do to people? I'm looking at the time and thinking I could move on. I could talk a lot about these things. Um, I think one of the, the findings and one of the comments by one of the participants that really shocked even me was by a funeral director and they rang to try and do a viewing and as we know um, often with violent crimes you can't do a viewing because the body is not in a pristine state. However, the uh, funeral worker said to the lady on the phone, oh well I'll have to defrost her first. And she said, it felt like he was talking about a frozen chicken. I couldn't tell my mum and dad what they'd said. Things like court cases and um, appeal dates, prosecution meetings. Think about dates of birth. Think about anniversaries of death. Think about when the crime occurred. Try, in its very simple sense, look at the dates before you around this person's significant life events when you're scheduling appointments. Try to be cognizant of that. That in itself is really helpful. Um, Another profound one was a lady who was, um, she hated the offender, hated his family, anything to do with him, they hadn't been kind in court. And then one day at her workplace, one of these, uh, I think it was a, a cleaner or someone said to her, look, I'm really sorry for what you've been through. You know, you've just been through the ringer sort of thing and, and said, you know, I, 
I don't know what to say, but my son killed a girl and I live with that every day and I'm just so sorry for what's happened to you, you know, and I'm sorry for what's happened to the, the family of, of the girl my son killed. And that was so healing and, and many people talked about all they wanted was acknowledgement from the offender or someone who represented the offender either metaphorically or in reality was associated with them. So I think that, that lends the question that we do need to think about restorative justice and conferencing and things for extreme violence as well. I am running out of time, so I'm going to keep ticking along. So in the few minutes I've got left, I want to talk to you about how to deliver support. What do I do and, and how do I make it meaningful to people? Well, in the context of the fifth research question was how can post-homicide support be improved according to secondary victims of homicide? And they talked about wanting a 24-hour free service. They wanted it available in-house or as an outreach service. They wanted no limitation around the crisis point or criminal justice system involvement. They wanted it to be available when they needed it. And interestingly, at Angel Hands, we get a lot of people who are post the crisis, maybe two years, three years afterwards, and they, want, they think life will have gone back to normal, criminal injuries has been sorted, the appeal's over, you know, everything's done and dusted in the criminal justice system, but I thought life would go back to normal and it hasn't. So that's when they come and say, we, we're really trying to make sense of this. Um, it needs to be need-driven, and I'll talk about the hierarchy of needs. Non-traditional settings. A lot of people found they didn't want to be clinicalised or pathologised. They just wanted to go somewhere that, you know, have a cup of tea in a coffee shop, you know, meet at the park, go for a walk, and particularly the men that I interviewed, and I was lucky enough to have quite a few men. I can't remember. I think it was about eight um, off the top of my head. And if anybody is doing research in this area, um, one of the sampling techniques tips I'll give you is actually put the word out there in front of you arriving. Arrive, meet the people, go somewhere else and do something and then come back because men took about a week after I first started doing interviews to then come forward and say, I want to be involved as well. They went away and talked to the women folk to get a sense of what it was about and then they put their hand up. They weren't the first to volunteer. So allow extra time for men to understand the process if you're wanting to get male participants. Just a little aside. Um, and they wanted it to be strengths-based. They wanted to be seen as people who were doing well in the face of such abnormal, extreme circumstances. And the staff competencies that they talked about was they needed to be proactive in their approach, they needed to be well-trained and aware of all of the elements and characteristics of helpful support, and they needed to be aware of the complexity of justice as a concept. So, what does that mean to how I practice? Um, I guess for me the support objectives that I came up with were around, um, oops, I'm back to that one. No, I've hidden this slide so I'll go back. I educate and manage the expectations of everyone, not just the victim or, or the you know, key victims, but everyone. What is justice? What would ever make this right? How is a court process going to make this okay? Whether they get 30 years, whether they get nothing, what is going to make this all right? So I start from that point of, in reality, we can't undo the harm. What we can do is we can learn to manage it. We can learn to live with it. We can learn to, to carry it. And I don't know how many of you have seen the, the thing going around Facebook lately, which talks about a psychologist who who says the cup half full, cup half empty analogy in some ways is very irrelevant when we start supporting people because what matters is how long you have to carry the cup, not whether it's half full or half empty. And I think that that helps people to realise that this is not, you know, there is no closure, there is no getting over extreme trauma. There's learning to master your trauma symptoms so that you're a master of your trauma, it's not your master. And I think once people get that concept, they start to have hope that they will feel better one day, that there will be a patch of blue in that terribly dark sky that they've been facing. 
So um, I also talk to them about the five aspects of justice. Now we in Western society rely very, very strongly on legal and economic justice, but we don't rely a lot on social and moral justice. And yet when we look at trauma recovery, that is by far the biggest aspect of helping people to heal is by delivering social and moral justice. And interestingly, in my research, people positioned the media within the justice system and they they saw the media as being capable of denying or delivering social and moral justice as the voice of the community that either, you know, pushed their cause and pushed for an autopsy to be done or another inquiry or, you know, a, a cold case review or whatever it was. If the media championed their cause for writing the injustice that they experienced, then it delivered social and moral justice. However, if it denied them any voice and, and sort of, you know, painted them in a dark picture, then it denied them that social and moral justice. Interestingly, um, I might mention here too that best friends often 50% of people's best friends were never seen again. And that was a real social injustice. It was a real loss to people in the study. I talked to them about the inherent tension between a criminal justice system's need to investigate and a therapeutic need to heal. So the information and the, the elongated nature of criminal justice is counter to what they need to heal for their trauma. They need timely, fast, you know, understanding of what's happened so that they can, you know, put all the pieces of the puzzle together and begin to move forward. Once they start to understand that that's a disconnect and that the criminal justice system and all the systems that they're going to encounter are logical, rational processes that we put in place to try to manage illogical, irrational experiences and that, you know, they do the best they can but they're never going to be perfect, actually helps people to say, well now I get why it doesn't work. It doesn't help them to feel any better per se, but it helps them to conceptualise what they're in the middle of. It helps them to look at that mass of craziness and go, I sort of understand. So I try to take a tour guide approach to helping them understand they've been picked up, dumped in a foreign country, they didn't even buy a ticket. They don't even know what language it is. They don't know what landmarks they have to visit. They don't know what languages are spoken in each of the different buildings that they're going to have to visit. And sometimes they'll get up a mountain on their own and sometimes they won't. And that's the approach that I use with them, that I don't know what their experience is going to be like. I can't predict it, but I can tell them that together we'll find a way through it. And that, I think, is is profoundly useful, particularly if we bear in mind Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And there's an emeritus professor, Taylor, from New Zealand who adapted Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And I love this diagrammatical you know, construct of it because it, he changed the bottom three levels to a milking stool. And he says that if any one of those things, those legs, is, is not the same length as the other, you know, everything's going to be skewed. It can still happen, but it's precarious and it's wobbly and, you know, and that's where that vulnerability and the, the lowered immunity to re-traumatisation comes in. If they haven't got a safe space, if they haven't felt that justice has been served, if they don't have anywhere to live, you know, if they don't feel like they belong anywhere, then how are they even going to get to that higher level of returning to life? So, in summary, I try to give you something, you know, funky and funny to remember. And uh, Anne's law is about acknowledgement of their fear, their powerlessness, and the situation that they find themselves in, at no, you know, by no cause of their own behaviours. So that non-judgmental is important, non-assumptive. People are so fascinating. I still get, what did you do to yourself? Why are you limping? You know. Um, the assumptions made about things that happen to people are huge. I didn't do this to myself. Somebody else did it to me, you know. The assumption that um, the fact I have had two prior pregnancies, you know, when I'm going to doctors, the assumption that I use abortion as a birth control method because, you know, the other two aren't with us. You know, the assumptions that I have had made upon me in life since then because I have two children or two pregnancies that are no longer, you know, here have been amazing. Um, you know, questions, are you married? Do you have children? 
They're simple questions. Don't assume that there are simple answers to them. People find having people's names taken off Medicare cards hard. They find, you know, all sorts of really basic life things really, really difficult. I still have a bank account, you know, 21 years later in my son's name because I can't walk into the bank and close it. You know, little things, the assumptions we make about things that happen in people's lives, try to put them aside, try to give them as much say and choice as possible. Um, and it starts from identification. People might not know what they do want, but turn the question around. Like all good researchers, what don't they want? Who don't they want to identify somebody? Where don't they want to do it? Turn it around and listen. Take the time. You know, we're caught up in this process of fast and furious and efficiency. Well, I've got to be telling you, in the face of, of life-changing experiences such as a violation, that's bullshit. It doesn't have to be fast, it doesn't have to be efficient, it's got to be sound, it's got to be well thought out. And um, listen to what they say with an attentiveness. People used to say to me all the time, how are you? I used to say, I'm fine, chop my right arm off this morning, I'm doing great. And they say, that's nice. <laughs> didn't actually even listen to what I was saying. So I was always testing for their trust. Were they trustworthy? Were they really listening to me? And a willingness to help. Not, you know, just like, oh yeah, pop up there and have a look. Be willing to help like it was somebody that you cared about. Not, not to the point that you cross boundaries, but in a way that just does more than fobbing them off to the next person. And if you can do all of that in a way that promotes hope, because one of the best um, quotes I've ever heard is a leader, a great leader is a dealer in hope. And I could have stood in the corner and done nothing and I would have been a beacon of hope to people in my world. You know, it, it's, it's amazing what having hope can do. We look at, you know, Mother Teresa, we look at Lady Diana, we look at Kate, you know, we look at, we look at the figures in our community that stand out in the media and the one thing they give us is hope, hope of a better tomorrow, hope that we can do things that we didn't think were possible. And if we educate people and we treat them with empathy and love, I find this one, and those of you who have heard me speak before will, will know this, but in Parliament here in Australia, and I'm sorry I did give you the language warning at the beginning, you can say fuck. You can say fuck in Parliament, but you can't say love. It's not right. It's not professional. I find that a sad indictment of our society that we live in today. So in all of that, we need to also be proactive, not reactive, and we need to recognise people's strengths. And on that, I will finish, I think, just about on time. <laughs>